Well, I think we're on the time. Uh, let me welcome all of you to the Ingersoll Lecture, uh, which uh, is in this year uh, a, a very special occasion because it's, uh, this also happens to be the 50th anniversary year of the admission of women to Harvard Divinity School, something that we're celebrating with our lectures throughout the year. And this lecture, which is one of the older in, uh, lecture endowments at Harvard, dating from 1893, um, is the first of our named lectures this year that will also be uh, devoted to honoring this 50th anniversary year. Uh, I think it's interesting that the original bequest, which, which amounted to $5,000 in 1893 um, before uh, 20th century inflation, uh, was made by Miss Caroline Haskell Ingersoll uh, from her own estate in honor of her father, George Goldthwaite Ingersoll, who was a Harvard alumnus. Uh, and she stipulated that the lecture not form part of the usual college course and was not to be delivered by any professor or tutor as part of his usual routine of instruction. <laughs> so this was clearly to be something special. The Ingersoll then titled On the Immortality of Man, that's when man was still the generic designation for human beings, um, was to be given once a year on the model of the Dudleyan Lecture. The choice of the lecture was not to be restricted to any one denomination or profession. Ms. Ingersoll further directed that the lecture should be made available to the public gratis in written form. Another woman, Mary S. Rauber, later increased the endowment by a bequest of her own. Uh, and I should note that the roster of distinguished speakers is very long, stretching back to 18, uh, the late 1890s, and includes William James, who was the second Ingersoll lecture in 1897, Josiah Royce in 1899, Alfred North Whitehead in 1941, Howard Thurman in 1947, Paul Tillich in 1962, Yaroslav Pelikan in 1963, and the first woman lecturer that we have, at least in the record, is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in 1970. In the years since then, eight other distinguished women scholars have addressed the topic. Jane I. Smith, Carolyn Bynum Walker, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, Nina Turmarkin, Mary Douglas, Wendy Doniger, Carol Zaleski, and Anna Marie Schimmel. Karen Armstrong is thus the tenth woman uh, of some 89 Ingersoll lecturers uh, to date. And it's a great pleasure to have her here tonight. Uh, I've enjoyed every encounter I've had with her, every podium I've shared with her. It's been nothing but a pleasure, and I think we can all look forward to a wonderful lecture tonight. To introduce her, I'm going to call on a longtime friend and a distinguished colleague, uh, Professor Diana Eck. Diana. Thank you, Bill. It is a pleasure to introduce Karen Armstrong this evening. Over the course of two decades, Karen has written with great care and insight on a wide range of religious subjects. She has reflected on her own experience as a Roman Catholic nun for seven years in Through the Narrow Gate, published in 1982, and in The Spiral Staircase, published last year. She has written out of the depth of her education at Oxford in English literature, a book on the English mystics of the 14th century, and her anthology of religious and poetic experience called Tongues of Fire. Her best first known, first best known book, and there are so many best known books now of Karen Armstrong, is A History of God, The 4,000 Year Quest of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, published in 1993, and on the New York Times bestseller list for months. That was the beginning of work that has garnered a, a wider and wider reading public. The Battle for God, A History of Fundamentalism, Holy War, The Crusades and Their Impact on Today's World, Muhammad, A Biography of the Prophet, Islam, A Short History, Jerusalem, One City, Three Faiths. She has received many awards, including one from the Muslim Public Affairs Council, for the public understanding of Islam, and that was before 9-11. I first met Karen in person at a symposium at which both of us spoke in February of 2000, where six of us had been pulled together by Marcus Borg to address the topic God at 2000, a daunting and wonderful weekend webcast and broadcast to people across the country from that huge hall at 
Oregon State University. The interest was huge and something that Karen confessed she very rarely encountered in Britain. Since then, she has fled to the United States from time to time to uh, visit here in Cambridge and to lecture to wider and wider audiences across the United States where, to her gratification, people are very, very interested in the things that she writes. She gave the Tillich Lecture at Memorial Church in 2001. She has been at the Faith and Life Forum in Memorial Church five or six times. In September of 2000, Karen Armstrong was slated to come to Harvard for a semester as a scholar in residence, having an opportunity to write and work quietly in the library. Her ticket was for September 12th, and she did not get here for a couple of weeks. It was wonderful to be with Karen and learn from her that semester, but it was not a quiet time. The U.S. needed what very few were able to provide, a judicious and clear and critical voice speaking about Islam, thinking with us about what had happened on 9-11 and its aftermath. As a New York Times critic put it, Armstrong can simplify complex ideas, but she is never simplistic. The Spiral Staircase was published in 2004. It has touched a chord across the country and garnered uh, many, many reviews, but Karen insists she never reads reviews, so I'd like to share one with her by uh, (laughs) Rabbi Arthur Wasco, who wrote this. Opening this book is like sitting down for coffee on a first date with someone who is interesting and odd. Your conversation becomes unexpectedly intimate, painful tales of bafflement and illness, gleaming crystals of self-discovery and joy. By the time you get up from the table, you have fallen in love. Karen is a self-described freelance monotheist who has nonetheless given spiritual guidance to Christians, Jews, and Muslims alike. Karen is a freelance scholar and writer whose work is widely read and studied in the academy, to be sure, and in the homes and hearts of many people who read very little what the rest of us write in the academy. And it is an honor to have this great interpreter of the religious currents of our time with us, Karen Armstrong. Thank you, Diana. Um, It's a great pleasure to be here um, and a a real honour to be giving this lecture, uh, the latest in a line of such distinguished luminaries. And of course, so of course, when I was invited, I accepted with great humility and alacrity, even though at first sight, the subject wasn't one that immediate was on on the top list of my favourite issues. the immortality, um, because I had always considered immortality simply in connection with the afterlife. And I have to say that uh, it's safe to say, I think, that as a child, my religious life was completely ruined uh, by the notion of the afterlife. Uh, the, whole th- the whole religious struggle seemed to me to be about getting into heaven and, sh- by, and squeaking in by the, s- the skin of your teeth. <laughs> As, a, as a, a, a Catholic child uh, in a convent school, I was taught about original sin very early. I, I knew what were the conditions of mortal sin, and it seemed perilously easy to commit these things. Um, and I, I was honestly convulsed with the fear of hell. I, I did, just did not see how I was ever going to get into heaven. Um, and I even resorted to these desperate measures of uh, wearing a scapula uh, of, the sa- of the sacred heart upon it um, and making the first Friday devotions. The, 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 the story went that if you went Uh, on the first Friday of every month for nine consecutive months to Mass and Communion, you were guaranteed uh, to the chance of confessing your sins before you died at the moment of death. I'm astonished to think at my school that was was teaching me this kind of nonsense, really, at the same time as they were trying to get me into Oxford and Cambridge. Um, So um, this, uh, this type of piety... Uh, and I think, I think my experience is not 
I'm not alone in this. It was a real relief for me uh, when I decided that I, I was just going to put the afterlife and heaven and hell to one side. Uh, because it often seems to me this kind of piety seems no more religious than paying in your monthly installments into your retirement annuity for a comfortable life in the hereafter. Um, it also seems slightly perverse religiously because religion is meant to be about the abandonment of the ego, uh, not about its eternal survival in optimum conditions. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it also breeds, it also can breed, not always by any means, but this kind of uh, literalistic belief in an afterlife uh, can lead to a kind of rather unpleasant exclusivity. I sometimes think that if some people got to heaven and found that everybody was there, they'd be furious. Um, <laughs> Because heaven wouldn't be heaven if you weren't going to sort of look uh, at the, over the celestial parapets and watch the other unfortunates uh, roasting below. Um, now, in, China, in various, some of the Chinese texts of the um, ancient world that I've been reading recently, very often uh, they'll have a refrain running through the, um, the, the whole uh, a chapter, sort of pu pulling you back to the central issue, uh, rather like the, like the refrain of a song. And I'm not going to do that because I think it would be boring, but if I had a, if I had a refrain, uh, a motto for this lecture, it would be this, ego distorts our vision and limits us. If we can go beyond ego, we experience immortality. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. We've, the afterlife is fine, uh, but it, we've seen, even, last, even yesterday, uh, that it, it, do, it is associated with some of the most horrendous events of our time. Those young men who believe that they're blasting their way into paradise, uh, where they'll enjoy their 70 virgins. Now, I don't believe they're doing uh, the, these appalling actions because of this. I think this is an oversimplification. But certainly this, is, this kind of imagery is used in association with these terrible acts. And then there are the fantasies of rapture by the Christian uh, fundamentalists who uh, believe that before the terrible tribulation of the last days they will be snatched into heaven uh, where they can watch uh, there's kind of ringside seat uh, the sufferings of their enemies uh, in, uh, at the hands of Antichrist, etc., and imagining great, uh, awful massacres at the end of time. Um, so we need, like, re not all religion is good. Um, you can have bad religion as you have bad art or bad cooking. In fact, religion is quite hard to do well. And in our modern world, we have some particular difficulties, I think, uh, because of the preponderance of rationality in our education. Uh, we are a, a, a culture of logos, uh, of reason, of science. Um, and uh, we tend, therefore, to slightly neglect the role of mythos, uh, the other great, the great way in which people uh, always in the pre-modern world um, came to a knowledge of the divine. Um, so, um, so part of our problem is therefore that uh, we often think of our doctrines, our religious doctrines, um, or the events of our historical tradition as though they were die-hard historical events. I remember when I was a young nun being told to write a, an essay entitled Assess the Historical Evidence for the Resurrection, um, not at, uh, completely downplaying the whole mythos of the event. Now, um, the word myth in popular parlance is often used simply to mean something that isn't true. If a politician is accused of a peccadillo in his past life, he's likely to say that it's a myth, it, it didn't happen. 
But um, that's, um, a, that's a very uh, bowdlerized notion of myth. Traditionally, a myth is something that in some sense happened once, but which also happens all the time. It, uh, the, a, a mythical event is liberated from the confines of, say, the first century uh, of the common era or the seventh century with the time of Muhammad and lifted in by means of ritual and ethical practice into the minds and hearts of worshippers and the faithful who are living in very, very different circumstances. Um, and unless, indeed, um, a, an, an event uh, can be mythologized in this way, it's, it's very difficult to see how it can be religious. It, uh, an event can just be a strange freak, the uh, crossing of the, uh, of the Israelites over the Sea of Reeds, which is activated each year in the ritual of the Passover Seder and made a living reality in the lives of Jews uh, throughout history. Um, has, um, it would be a, just a, a freak occurrence of something that ha would have no relevance to anybody's interior world. Um, religion and myth address what is timeless in human life. Um, it's, a myth is also uh, a, a program for action. It is telling us how we should behave uh, in order to access the holiness of, of this event um, and, 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 to, and to make it a reality in our own lives by a disciplined exercise of the imagination. And I think here, too, is how this is the way I've, I've come to see uh, the notion of immortality. I don't think immortality is about uh, an endless succession of moments uh, that will occur after we d throw off this mortal coil. Um, immortality, I, like eternity, is timeless. Uh, it is outside the confines of space and time. And it, I think this has been a, an, a major theme of religious life, to encounter a reality that frees you from the constraints of, our, of, of, of time and space that liberates you from the fear of our mortality, which haunts us so desperately as human beings. We are the only animals that have to live with the knowledge of our mortality. And we've always found that difficult and have created uh, works of art um, and um, um, religions uh, in order to come to terms with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with our extinction. Now, I may not, as a child, have been very good at uh, the afterlife. I didn't use that skillfully um, and, and relinquished it at the, you know, at the first possible moment. But um, I was very keen on the idea of transcendence, uh, so much so that I, as at the age of 17, I uh, went off to a convent. Uh, it was not a wise decision, but I was in trying to make the, the uh, remote realities of God or even Jesus um, a, a, a vibrant presence in my own life. Uh, I was on the right lines, I think, um, because I think this is what religion is about. Uh, as human beings, we all seek transcendence. Transcendence has been a fact of human life. We all have experiences that seem to touch something deeply buried within ourselves and lift us momentarily onto another plane so that we feel just for those few moments that despite all the dis depressing evidence to the contrary, life has some ultimate meaning and value. Um, and um, it, it, some people have called this ecstasy. Now, that doesn't mean that we are then floating off into a, an alternative state of consciousness or, or freaking out or going into a trance. Ecstasy means uh, the Greek word stepping out, stepping outside the confines of our normal experience. We look out for these uh, experiences uh, when we seem to be inhabiting our humanity more fully than usual. And if we don't find it, in a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a temple anymore, uh, we look for it elsewhere. In my country, 
uh, as Diana indicated, the churches are becoming are empty. Uh, last time I went to church in England, uh, there were five of us there and a dog. Um, and we were very glad to have the dog there to swell the audience. Um, but, and, and the churches are becoming um, warehouses and art galleries, restaurants and apartment buildings. The people of Europe, uh, and especially of Britain perhaps, are voting with their feet. They no longer find ecstasies in these, these, these buildings, uh, but they are very interested in transcendence. They seek it in art, music, um, politics, sport, um, sex, mistakenly in drugs, which give you a quick ecstasy. Uh, because this is what human beings do. We are driven to this. And some people um, seek to make this ecstasy a permanent reality in their lives by the disciplined practices of introspection and prayer. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, now, if we think of some of the other uh, doctrines of our faith. I think, you see, I think they're all, when we get down deep enough to the religious experience, these uh, various themes of the religious life, such as God, or say uh, a leading figure like Muhammad or Jesus, and immortality, all, uh, can all come down uh, to very much a, a core. After all, in heaven, what are we supposed, do we imagine ourselves doing for all eternity, but being with God? Some would say being merged with God, uh, encountering God, living in the presence of God, enjoying the beatific vision. Um, and, and similarly, um, the, the, we, if we, 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 it's a mistake to get too hung up on the historical and factual uh, aspects of our tradition. Uh, and neglect the, myth, the mythos of them uh, that make them a living reality in, in, in our lives. Um, take, for example, um, the figure of, of Jesus, who, say, in the Greek Orthodox Church, um, is a rather Buddha-like figure. The, the Greek Orthodox don't really think that Jesus died to save us from our sins. Uh, some say that uh, Adam that Jesus would have, become, God would have in some sense have become human even if Adam hadn't sinned. It was part of God's embrace of humanity. And eventually, after the Council of Chalcedon and all these other acrimonious councils, the Greeks came to the, in, the, the uh, point of view that, um, that Jesus was the first fully deified human being. Uh, that he was so closely identified with divinity that there was there's no the hair's breadth between him and, and God, um, and we can all be like him, even in this life. That one of their their favourite icons of Jesus is on when he on Mount Tabor, when he is uh, in, transfigured before them and light comes from his garments, um, and. He is transfigured humanity, rather like the Buddha, who is pictured sitting in, in, in trance, in ecstasy, in peace and serenity. And it's a very Buddhist um, idea, this. Uh, Buddhists would, some Buddhists would say that the Buddha was, is the first fully enlightened being, human being in our historical era. And we too can, and indeed must, become like the Buddha. We all have a potential for Buddhahood within us. We can all achieve that enlightenment. And the stories uh, about the Buddha uh, tell, tell, tell each Buddhist how he or she uh, can, can affect his or her own enlightenment. Um, and Muhammad, a uh, very clear historical figure. Um, we, we know more about him. Um, than we know about any other, uh, almost any other, uh, founder of a major world tradition because he was so much later. Um, and so there's no, there's no doubt that any of these figures actually existed. Uh, but the, the important thing is the religious use made of them. Muhammad has been translated into a mythos uh, by means of Muslim law, which uh, instruct Muslims to uh, eat and pray and wash and speak and love 
and make, greet his friends um, and walk around just as Muhammad does. It, the Muslim law is, is, is based upon the sunnah, the behavior of the prophet. And that means the ideal is that you can, in any Muslim who is fully observant, you see the prophet walking around, how he would have behaved, being lifted out of the 7th century and, you know, into, uh, the, the, into the li heart of the lives, of religious lives of Muslims living centuries um, apart from, from these extraordinary events of his life. Um, so, um, so uh, Muhammad, uh, the idea is not just to follow Muhammad slavishly in his external uh, gestures, but the idea is that by um, imitating and modeling our behavior on those uh, aspects of his life, we will begin to cultivate his internal uh, disposition of Islam, a total surrender and openness to God, a total abandonment of ego and a total openness to, to the divine, which enabled him to have the revelations and to pass them uh, to other people. So, uh, that, so the, I, what I'm trying to say is that God and Jesus and uh, Muhammad and the Buddha are not distant figures, uh, confined, imprisoned in history. Uh, in the, uh, they are historical figures, but they're not, it's, they're not uh, shut there for all eternity because they are activated by our religious practices and made a living presence in our lives. And I think this is what uh, we should do with immortality. If you, uh, the, many of the great sages of the religious life were very wary indeed about uh, talking about the afterlife. Even St. Paul, who was very much thinking in apocalyptic eschatological terms, said famously, I have not seen ear hath not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared uh, for those who love him. Um, and um, the Buddha, for example, when questioned about nirvana, would a Buddha who had been enlightened, would, such, would a Buddha be alive and exist in nirvana, said this was really an inappropriate question inappropriate or improper question because we just don't have the experience or the evidence or the words or the concepts to talk about such a state. Uh, you can ask this question, but we don't know. Um, and in, in, in Buddhist tradition, it is a heresy to say that the Buddha is not alive and existent in Nirvana, but it's also a heresy to say that he is not that he is, or I forgot which one I said first. But um, uh, so, uh, so th th telling you that we're here, we're at the end of what words and thoughts can usefully do. Um, and just as we are with God, uh, God is uh, not something that we can define or label or set limits upon, uh, like Nirvana or Brahman, God is indescribable because he goes beyond our ordinary mundane experience. And Confucius uh, positively discouraged his uh, disciples, uh, his pupils, uh, from speculating about the afterlife. Um, and, and, and this was unusual because the Chinese, until his time, had been, uh, made a great cult of ancestors. And the whole Chinese cult was very much geared to worshipping the ancestors, ma making sure that your own ancestors achieved their immortality and were, were turned into a benevolent presence for the community. You're very much concentrating on life after death. But um, as Confucius said, until you have learned to serve men, how can you serve spirits? Um, and, uh, and, and until you know about the living, how can you learn about the dead? Concentrate, said Confucius, on what you have here, on what we know we have. Uh, don't waste time in speculation. This is what we have. Uh, and that, but that doesn't mean that we're imprisoned in terror and mortality and uh, despair at, the, at our possible extinction because we are, uh, by our religious practice, uh, making uh, a discovery that we have an immortal self. Because once, uh, in, at first, 
in the very early stages of the religious history of humanity, not many of the peoples of the world believed in the personal immortality of the human being. The Greeks, for example, uh, saw the you, there was a kind of afterlife, but people were literally shadows of the form, their former selves down in the underworld. They are gibbering. Uh, they uh, are fluttering around. It's, it's inhuman, almost obscene, brought alive by blood being poured out in front of them or into, into their grave. And when you passed um, the grave of the, of the dead hero of your city, uh, you, uh, you, you averted your gaze um, uh, because the, you knew that the hero was furious at being dead. Uh, he was down there in the underworld, uh, his wraith chuntering away down there. But this was no uh, great apotheosis. And, and the Psalms are very clear uh, that there's not much life down there in Sheol. Who will praise you there in Sheol, says the psalmist. And indeed, uh, the idea of uh, personal immortality in an afterlife has never been a very central preoccupation in Judaism. Um, I mean, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, Gilgamesh is told that human beings can't have immortality and that his job is, if he wants to be remembered after his death and gain some immortality, uh, then um, he, he'd better build his city, uh, build some wonderful city walls and, uh, and use the new technique of writing uh, to achieve his immortality. But things began to change uh, with what Karl Jaspers called the Axial Age, the period from about 900 to 200 BCE, when men, with the, many of the great world religions that have continued to nourish humanity either came into existence or had their roots. So you have Confucianism, Taoism in China, Hinduism and Buddhism in India, and monotheism begins uh, in Israel. Uh, the Greeks, they're another story, very interesting, but they are another, a slightly different story. They're going on at the same time. And one of the great discoveries of the Axial Age was the inner world. Uh, ancient religion had not gone in much for disciplined introspection, uh, but this was one of the, uh, that, that people, as they had more leisure, as their societies became more complex, they began to discover introspection and practices such as yoga, which may, have, may or may not have been um, a very ancient practice in, in the subcontinent of India, uh, was greatly developed uh, at that time, a real journey into the, inner, into the inner world. And as they journeyed into the inner world, they became very interested indeed in the immortal self or the immortal soul. These two are different, and I just want to get this out of the way. In India, when they talked about the Atman or the, or the, in, the, uh, the self, they're not talking about the soul because it, it's not considered a purely spiritual um, um, aspect. It's, it's the essence of the human being, body and soul. So it's, it's a, an important distinction there. Um, and they, they came to believe that we all had within ourselves the capacity or the potential to develop um, a state of mind, a state of serene peace in which we felt free from the terror of mortality um, and uh, became almost um, transcendent to our surroundings, but we discovered it within ourselves. Um, and it was hard to discover. So people would started to look for the self or the soul. And this was hard to do because the self was lay beyond our normal psychomental experience. We often think uh, today that our feelings, our ideas, our intellectual thoughts are the highest and most spiritual parts of us. But this is not to be confused with what they were looking for. They were looking, as one of the, one of the uh, Indian sages said, for the, the, that which perceives, uh, or that which the perceiver, as it were, with a capital P, that lies behind our perception, the hearer that li lies behind our capacity to hear, the seer that lies behind our capacity to see. And that's very difficult to get to. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, the uh, sages of the Axial Age were not deterred by difficulty. And they mounted a heroic quest in search of this inner self. Um, now, one of the first 
of concerted and organized of these attempts was undertaken by the sages of the Upanishads, probably starting in about the 7th century BC. Um, and they, uh, they did experience, with, by means of their disciplines of, um, of, of introspection um, and of, of dismantling uh, normal habits of thought, uh, they did begin to glimpse what they, uh, the, the self, what they called the Atman, uh, the inner self, the essence of the human being, which they said was identical with Brahman, the ultimate reality. It's a very important religious moment because uh, everybody has followed them there. Uh, in all the religious traditions, it's clear that God, or, or, is, or is not, for example, in the monotheistic tradition, is not just something out there, some distant reality, some kind of cosmic big brother, some overseer. He's also discovered in the depths of the self. He's also experienced within. God is here with them. We, and Christ, uh, we, we see Christ in others, which means we see uh, the divine aspects of the human being. Uh, within, within each other. This is an important, an important moment. Now, they, this self was immortal. Uh, this is what, here's a description. Uh, the self, the Atman, was immortal beyond hunger and thirst, sorrow and delusion, old age and death, imperishable, indestructible. Now, these people weren't on cloud cuckoo land. They knew they were going to die. Um, and uh, they, you know, they saw their friends and, and, and fellow mystics die. But this was not the point. Uh, if you managed, they say, to let go of your ego, um, you would uh, go into the Brahman, you would be dissolved into the Brahman at, when you died. But you had to let go. Um, and that's difficult to do because we are instinctively uh, uh, geared to preserving our ego at all costs. I mean, it, life is tough out there. We can't just wander around in a trance. Uh, we, we are programmed ever since we came out of the caves to defend number one, to make sure we get enough to eat, to ensure that we survive and that our children, our offspring and our, our tribe survives. Personal survival is a very, very, very strong drive within us. Uh, but if we can lay that aside, uh, and managed to make the supreme spiritual effort to let that uh, yearning for personal survival and per permanence go, then we probably do enter uh, a, a different stage of consciousness, an alternative, something, a completely different mentality. Um, so, but, you ha but this was a long process. It was no, there was no born-again Upanishadic experience where... <laughs> you suddenly, instantly discovered the Atman and that was it. Um, this was a long, long, slow, disciplined process. Um, and in the Upanishads, you're not going to get that experience simply by reading the text uh, because the, the texts are simply giving you the end of the meditat meditative process. Um, but you can see what was kind of going on. One of the sages, one of the first... Um, you would have conversations rather like a Socratic dialogue uh, with some of his pupils and disciples and gradually I'd ask them what they thought the Atman was and each time they would, he would show that this was an inadequate notion, an inadequate notion until you began to realize that you were moving beyond what you could usefully think or say about this level of ineffable experience. And finally, uh, you're reduced to silence. Suddenly they, they fall silent and in that silence is a moment of realization that you are beginning to move beyond the power of ordinary words and ordinary thought processes. Um, so, and it was a long, long training in inwardness. Um, the, uh, the practitioners were encouraged to look at their inner life, to think about their dreams, for example. Was the Atman, what happened when we went to sleep? and could create suddenly whole worlds. We became creator gods, creating carts and, and, and um, seas and rivers. Um, and then we go into really deep sleep when we're completely lost to the world and not even dreaming. Was that the Atman? Uh, was that the Atman? Or was our breath the Atman? 
um, these were these these were all they were beginning to discover the deeper and deeper layers of the personality uh, in a disciplined way. Um, but it's, it, it was a long process. First, you had to be prepared to give up your ego. Now, a lot of religion is geared precise, not to losing our ego, but precisely to propping up our egotism. Uh, a lot of people don't want to lose themselves in religion. They want religion to make, give them a greater sense of identity. More, they want to be themselves and more so. I mean, those... The, 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 that's, that's one of the flaws of those oversimplistic ideas of heaven and hell and, and personal survival. The Upanishads thought that to desire to go to join the gods in heaven was an inferior desire because you're just wanting to let your old, dreary, old, flawed, egotistic, grasping, uh, uh, frightened uh, self go on in the next world. And this was not the point. The point was to let that ego go. And as one of them said, you know, you, when all the seas, uh, when all the rivers uh, c finally flow into the sea, they're not saying, I am this river and I am that river anymore. They, they, they've let themselves go. Um, and that's what you have to do if you want to experience moments of immortality in this world. But the experience of this uh, state of uh, serenity, peace, uh, joy. Here's, here's another description. Uh, once, once you have um, encountered, uh, entered into your Atman, you, you are calm, composed, cool, patient, and collected. Almost what we would call heavenly peace. But you could do it in this world of pain and fear. Um, now, there's a story in one of the Upanishads that Indra, the great warrior god, uh, decided that he wanted to find his Atman too. So he came down to earth and studied with a guru but, uh, and had to live like a simple uh, Brahminical student. He had to collect his teacher's firewood. He had to li be, live a, a non-violent life. He had to be chaste, sem humble, self-effacing. Um, and this was Indra who was addicted to violence, never stopped boasting about his exploits in the usual mythologies. And it still, even Indra, the god, it took him 101 years for him to find the, the Atman, to experience this inner peace uh, and to, dis to experience this inner dimension of himself. And so that was meant to encourage people. Look, it took Indra that long. So don't give up yet. This, 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 is, this is a long process. So Religious truth um, will not make ever any sense. We're, whatever we're discussing, whether it's the nature of God or the nature of immortality or the divinity of Christ, it will make no sense to us unless we are prepared uh, ourselves to be transformed by it. And, I think, to let the ego go. Remember my little mantra, ego distorts our vision and limits us. If we can get beyond it, we experience immortality. Now, the Buddha uh, called this uh, supreme uh, state Nirvana. Um, and he described it very much as an experience out of time, free from um, the constraints of time and space and fear and sickness and aging and all that. Uh, he called, at various times in the Buddhist text, uh, Nirvana is called the unborn, unaging, deathless, sorrowless, incorrupt, and supreme freedom. Um, and it, sometimes he gave it deathless, was the most, one of the most common of these epithets. He also gave uh, more positive descriptions. He called it, the, uh, Nirvana was the other shore, uh, peace, the supreme goal, the beyond, the harbor, the everlasting. Um, and the Buddha was convinced that this was not a supernatural state. This was entirely natural to humanity to do this. In fact, you were perfecting your humanity. And the enlightened human being who had managed to achieve nirvana uh, was simply demonstrating spiritually what the potential of the human being could be. Just as an athlete, an Olympic athlete or a dancer, reveal a, pot a potential in the human body uh, and its capacities that is beyond the untrained person, certainly of myself, 
Um, and so um, the literal meaning of nirvana, however, was blowing out. And what was being blown out was the fires of greed and egotism. Uh, one of the pop most popular and favorite ways of achieving nirvana was by the contemplation of what the Buddha called anatta, no self, that we had no self. Um, uh, and this, uh, often people say, oh dear, this is real very negative. Um, and various postmodern uh, literary critics have said we have no, dis no self. We're just a passing succession of states. But the Buddha wasn't really interested in this kind of metaphysics. What he was saying was, as usual, this was a program for action. He wanted people to behave as though the self did not exist. And if they did behave in this way, they would find that they were much happier. And the texts show that when the disciples first hear the doctrine of Anatta, they rejoiced. And it sounds weird to us that people would rejoice by being told that they didn't exist. But if you think about it... Uh, if you think about it, it's, uh, it would be a wonderful relief. We've all had those moments when we wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and think, why don't I have this? Why does this happen to me? Why um, can't I have what X has? And on and on we go. It is our selfishness, our, our self-regarding uh, uh, tendency that makes us miserable. It is the cause of the pain and suffering and what the, or, or dukkha, what, uh, as the Buddha called it, that we're trying to get beyond. Um, and so if we lived a, a, as a constant practice of um, as though the self did not exist, uh, we, would, um, we would achieve um, a much greater uh, peace of mind. Uh, though it's hard to do, because, as I say, we are endemically and chronically selfish. Another thing, another of his practices was called the immeasurables. He used to uh, urge uh, both lay people and monks alike to send out waves of benevolence to all the four corners of the earth, not omitting a single creature from this radius of concern, so that you learn to rejoice with other people's joy. And that's not all. We don't always do that. There's usually some lurking um, sort of resentment hovering around in our, in our, our being. Um, or, or, or really sympathize with another person's pain. Or, and, and feel total equanimity towards all beings so that we uh, don't prefer one to another. Um, and that's, again, very, very different. A lifetime's job. But if you do it, you, uh, if you did break free of this self-oriented constriction, uh, the experience, and I quote, is expansive, without limits, enhanced, without hatred and petty malevolence. And it can lead to what the Buddha called release of the mind, which was his synonym for nirvana. Your mind is set free of all this fear and terror and egotistic uh, self-striving. Self um, we have to be prepared to let ourselves go and not think we're so precious and special that we should be permanent. The idea is that if we can, if we could sort of let that go, we'd be even better. You know, we'd be enhanced, this, this, this free and, and loving person. And the Chinese understood this very well. One of them, the fourth century Taoist, uh, Zhuangzi, um, uh, decided early that... It, had a sort of conversion experience when he realized that it was impossible to preserve your life indefinitely. Nobody could. And at first, for three months when he realized this, he was, went into a depression. Uh, but afterwards, he experienced an absolutely liberating freedom. Uh, like many of the Chinese, he saw the whole of reality as what he called uh, a great transformation, like a whole lot of roiling atoms uh, that periodically came together and formed a new entity for a while, like this podium, or you, or me, or that camera. And then eventually the, the, these, at, these, these aspects of, uh, of reality fell away, and you rejoined the cauldron again. And he said, we've got to go with the flow, literally. Uh, you've got to go with this thing. When, and he would sometimes try to shock his disciples into an acceptance of this. When his own wife died, a friend called around to see him, pay a condolence call, and was utterly shocked to see Zhuangzi uh, sitting on um, a, 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 the log of a tree, 
uh, singing at the top of his voice and bashing the time out with, on an old battered old tub. And he said, what are you doing? This was your wife. And the Chinese had very elaborate uh, ceremonials of mourning. What are you doing? She was your wife for all those years. Surely you should mourn for her. And Zhuangzi smiled. And he said, when she died, I mourned like everybody else. But then I realized that um, I was completely going against the flow of, of what reality is. Um, now she's gone back. From, I thought back to the time before she was born. Suddenly there was a, a wonderful change in the, this great boiling cauldron of reality that's constantly changing. It all come, came together and suddenly there was my dear wife. And now she's gone back to join that great transformation. She's, like, she's in the best place. She's in the, in the bosom of the way, the Tao. Uh, she's like the four seasons that come and go. Um, and, you know, why should I hold on to her in this selfish way? Um, and there's another story where uh, one of his friends goes along to visit a man who's dying and is appalled to find the wife and children sobbing by the deathbed. He says, shoo, get out, you know, uh, don't interrupt, change in the, in the process. Um, and he, then he leans against the, and says, I wonder what you're going to be made, come, come back as next. And maybe you'll come back as a rat or a, an insect's leg. Um, and, you know, the dying man smiles and he says, you know, I was uh, so fortunate to have been born human at all. And uh, the, the, the processes of life have been so generous to me and they brought me to this. How ungrateful it would be for me to insist that I must be a human next time. Um, he said, I'll go to sleep and then I'll wake. And so there is a kind of constant kind of playfulness uh, but a sense that if we, if we allow our precious selves to go, then we'll get something richer. Now, Confucius, whom I mentioned earlier, who um, didn't have much time for, um, uh, you know, talking about heaven or the next world, um, was the, probably the first pers uh, person, at least in my um, cognizance, to make it crystal clear that religion was essentially altruism. Uh, he was once asked, what is the single thread that runs through all your teaching? Uh, what is it that draws it together? He said, it's this, consideration, shu, do not do to others as you would not have done to you. Um, and what, said his disciples, what is the practice that we can put into practice all day and every day? And he said, do not do to others as you would not have done to you. And this demands... Uh, he called it the shu, it means really, it's, it's good translation is likening to oneself. You look into the depths of your own uh, world, work out what it is that gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstances to inflict anything like that on anybody else. And if we were doing that day by day, moment by moment, uh, hour by hour, we wouldn't have time to... Uh, spend worrying, be worrying about heaven or hell or scapulars or the first Friday devotions or, or even the exist because, and we would be in a state of constant ecstasy because we are, that such a practice demands that we dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there on a daily hourly basis we are stepping outside the constraints of our selfishness and this brings a certain immortality um, now, um, but he said that Confucius was not at all interested in what his disciples or he himself were going to go to. I, mean, I think it's significant that the Chinese like to refer to the ultimate reality as the way. It's a path that is, and treading that path is an end in itself. It is wholly absorbing wholly dynamic. You don't need to be worrying about whether, what you're going to. You're not going to a place in the Confucian world, or, nor are you going to a person or a personalized God. You are simply treading the path. And you're, what you're being introduced to is a state of transcendent goodness, which Confucius called Ren. Uh, and he refused to define it. Later sages would, would define it as benevolence, but that was too narrow for Confucius, who said that it's beyond any category in our society, this. 
because it takes us beyond into a state that is beyond what we know. It's a lifelong struggle because it demands the eradication of our vanity, resentment and the desire to dominate others that we do all the time. But here is what his favorite disciple said about Ren. Uh, this, his favorite disciple, Yan Hui, whom Confucius always felt uh, was further along the path than he himself. With a deep sigh, Yan Hui uh, then said what, what it was like to practice Ren day by day. The more I strain my gaze towards it, Ren, the higher it soars. The deeper I bore down into it, the harder it becomes. I see it in front, but suddenly it's behind. Step by step, the master skillfully lures one on. He has broadened me with culture, restrained me with ritual. Even if I wanted to stop, I could not. Just when I feel that I have exhausted every resource, something seems to rise up, standing over me, sharp and clear. Yet though I long to pursue it, I can find no way of getting to it at all. Now, Ren is not something you get, but something that you give day by day, not in, in, by practicing the golden rule. Um, but it is, notice the aspects of transcendence of that. Uh, the, the, the practice of walking with Ren uh, wells up from within, and it also stands over him as a sort of companionable presence, sharp and clear, both an imminent and, and transcendent divine. And that's simply by walking the path. Uh, what basically what Confucius and what the Buddha would say is, or even St. Paul uh, would say, is what happens after our death is not our business. That we, can, we can walk the path. And here are some other Confucian quotes. Uh, Mencius uh, um, says, said that the golden rule brought him to a state of mystical oneness with the whole of reality. All the 10,000 things are in me. There is no greater joy for me than to find on self-examination that I am true to myself. Try your best to treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself, and you will find that this is the shortest way to Ren. Uh, and by behaving as though other people were as important as yourself, you would close the gap between heaven and earth in your own person you would close the gap between heaven and earth and become the Chinese felt a godlike being yourself. And then Zunzi, uh, the, probably the, one of the greatest Confucians of all in the third century, a rationalist in many ways, but also a mystic and a poet, uh, writes this about what he calls the great and true enlightenment when, you're, uh, when the mind is empty of self, unified and still. And he has achieved a panoptic vision. This is almost like a heavenly vision of being in heaven, except you're here on earth. Uh, he who has such enlightenment may sit in his room and view the entire area within the four seas, may dwell in the present and yet discourse on distant ages. He has a penetrating insight into all beings and understand their true nature studies the ages of order and disorder and comprehends the principle behind them. He surveys all heaven and earth, governs all beings and masters the great principle and that all that is in the universe. Uh, such a being is, said, he said, godlike, broad and vast. Who knows the limits of such a man? His brightness matches the sun and moon. His greatness fills the eight directions. Such is the great man. Um, now, um, we can sit there saying, uh, well, that's all very well, but I don't believe a word in it. But that's because uh, we haven't submitted ourselves to this regimen. Uh, I mean, sorry, but maybe many of you have. Um, but um, one of the reasons why the Buddha, for example, always refused to define nirvana was that it is a, a state of utter selflessness that is absolutely incomprehensible to those of us who have not divested of ourselves of our egotism. The Buddha uh, would die, he would grow old and sick and die a uh, painful, lonely death of dysentery. 
But the point was that in Nirvana, it wasn't a, it wasn't a place or a person, it was something that he discovered in a core of sacred peace uh, that in the heart of his being that enabled him to live at peace in the midst of suffering. Not in a, in a cut-off way by which, you know, he put himself into a trance and the rest of the world could go hang, because the other side of this was that you had to practice compassion for all living beings. This is part of your discipline, uh, compassion and selflessness. Uh, and, and, of course, the compassion and selflessness are one. Now, uh, Christianity, despite it, it, it got a, Christianity and Islam both got uh, affected by Zoroastrianism with its sort of uh, rather vengeful vision of the end of times and em battles and uh, the division of the world into good and evil doers, etc. Uh, but uh, they knew this very well. I mean, in that early hymn uh, quoted by St. Paul in Philippians, uh, he talks about how Jesus achieved apotheosis as a human being, by divesting himself of himself, uh, he emptied himself and accepted the status of a slave and even went unto death, a humiliating death on a cross. Therefore hath God exalted him to a, a, and given him a status that is above every human being uh, and called him Lord. It's the same process. Give up yourself uh, and you will experience a fulfillment, an enhancement of your being. Um, and you see a different kind of humanity. Uh, there's a story that one day a Brahmin priest passed by and saw the Buddha uh, concentrated, praying, uh, well, meditating in that serene, strong way. And he, he was reminded of an elephant, a Tusker elephant, all that restrained and powerful force concentrated in him. He'd never seen a human being like that. Are you a god, sir? He said. No, said the Buddha. Are you a spirit or an angel? No, uh, he said. I, I, no, said the Buddha. He'd simply found a new potential in human nature, had uh, activated aspects of his humanity that normal, in normal pe untrained people were dormant. So what shall I call you, said the Brahman priest? You can just say, to, remember me, said the Buddha, as one who is awake. Uh, he had woken up to the whole uh, range of his, um, um, of his humanity. Now I'm going to close by reminding us, of course, that this is not just a selfish quest. Uh, obviously, it uh, means compassion. Um, that's part of achieving it. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's inextricably uh, bound up in it. But the Chinese believed that a man who'd achieved, and I'm afraid they did think in male terms, uh, rather, uh, that, that, that uh, someone who'd achieved this uh, affected his environment. He had, an, a man who was totally without self, had an effect on his environment. Uh, just simply by walking around, he made a difference. I think of Gandhi. You must yourself become the change that you wish to see in the world. Um, and especially they felt that if a ruler uh, could divest himself of himself, he could change the world. Uh, because he wouldn't be going to wars for selfish gains uh, or anything of that sort. Here is a final quote from Mencius about what such a person can be. A mature person transforms where he passes and works wonders where he abides. He is in the same stream as heaven above and earth below. Can he be said to bring but small benefit? Thank you. Our speaker has graciously agreed to take questions, and I think we have, she's left us, I think, ample time for about 25 minutes of questions if we need them, and uh, so we'll do that. I would ask only one thing, and that is we have two microphones available, and I'd like for you to please use them, not because we might not be able to hear your stentorian tones, uh, but because this is being recorded, and we'd like to have the questions recorded as well as the answers, so thank you if you would. Wait on the mic. 
Yes, sir. Thank you so much, uh, both for your lecture today and your books, uh, which mean a great deal to me. Uh, there is one mystery I would like to raise, and uh, perhaps uh, maybe it's a misunderstanding on my part, but your emphasis, uh, or you're uh, talking about, and this is so consistent, divesting oneself of himself. Um, and I, I think that's so central to so many in the lives of the saints. Uh, uh, John Henry Newman talked about, uh, if you would be great, make, make yourself little. Um, but the, the thing that intrigues me is that it seems like that's in such contradiction with the way we we need to uh, give children a sense of themselves. Yes. That is, that is it only after you have achieved yourself a kind of vocation, a kind of fulfillment in your life that you can then rid yourself of yourself? No, I thank you. That's a very important point, and I should have made this clear. Um, the, uh, well, I'm not talking about, any, uh, about endlessly humiliating people or bringing them down to earth and, uh, you know, telling them they're nothing and making them uh, crawl around kissing people's feet and things. All of the, you know, to remind you of how lowly a little worm you are. This, I spent seven years doing this as a young man. Um, and it was a complete waste of time. Um, you know, bec why? Because you become so concentrated on your own performance that you're stuck in the ego that you're supposed to transcend. Um, and, uh, no, I think it, when, we're, when they're talking about self, they're not saying, uh, of course you must be, your, you know, as full a human being as you can be. But it, the self, selfishness, it's selfishness, I think, that which when we look at something, we immediately instinctively say, do I want that? How can I get that? Is this going to harm me? How is this going to affect me? so that we see everything from our own point of view. We, we grasp at things. Uh, we're greedy. We want things. Uh, and that's the kind of, that, this, this, it's that kind of self that grasps and clings, and which is the source of a lot of our hatred. Because once we've set our minds on getting something at all costs, um, then, uh, you know, we, then other people who might sort of be, get ahead, be ahead of us in, in that, the stampede for that good thing uh, become our enemies. Uh, so, and that's why I think the best way to lose your selfishness if you're not able to do yoga, and I, 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 I know my limitations, I, I wouldn't be able to do that, that kind of yoga, which is a great assault on this kind of egotistic thinking to take the I out of your thought, uh, thought processes. Um, compassion is the best way. Uh, just living a, a constantly compassionate life so that you must have a developed sense of self in order to practice the golden rule. Uh, you must be able to say what it is that I hate, uh, what gives me pain. You must be aware of that in order not to inflict it on others. Um, and as the, uh, one, uh, it says in the Bible, love your neighbor as yourself. You must love yourself. And that doesn't mean endlessly bashing yourself up because you're a sinful person, uh, because that's a form of narcissism, I think. I think guilt is a form of, of ego. Because uh, often you're, you're, it's just reminding you you're not quite the sp splendid person that you thought you might be. Um, and, um, but, but compassion is the best way because it is asking you all the time, and it's a hard discipline, to, say, to put yourself in the position of another. But that means that you must have, be compassionate to yourself too. Um, not endlessly, you know, uh, lambast yourself for your failings or, or tell yourself you haven't got good qualities. A Jewish friend of mine uh, who was alive in the Holocaust in Germany uh, said that as a young boy he um, uh, was l looking at all this propaganda uh, and this anti-Semitic propaganda. And he, he was about eight years old and he lay in bed and said, no, I will not accept that. Uh, evaluation of myself. I do have good qualities. I do have talents. I'm not what they say. And he said, how can I love my neighbor as myself if 
I don't have that appreciation of myself. So I think, I, I'm glad you may ask that question. I'm not talking about ego bashing in, in that way. Uh, but I am saying that we, when we uh, put other people uh, often in, in, in the place of ourselves in the centre of our universe sometimes, as a continuous practice, how would I like such and such a thing said of me uh, or of my, um, or, or my own people if we're lambasting another nation, for example, um, and then refrained? Then, in that moment, you've transcended yourself. Um, yes. This is one, and then perhaps. A uh, simple question. Uh, you uh, referred to the immeasurables, oh. and I just wondered if you could uh, explain what you meant by that, the immeasurables. Uh, uh, this, this is the, the name given to it in the Buddhist text. It's immeasurable because these, uh, med the, these impulses of goodness, uh, well, of, of benevolence to all creatures, have no measure. Uh, they have no limit. Uh, they must ex exclude not a single creature, not even a mosquito, uh, from your radius of concern. And they make, they make you without measure too because as your um, consciousness and, and benevolence expands, uh, you lose the constrictions of ego and you become immeasurable too. I'd like to invoke the image of Karen Armstrong working on her next book. She's immersed in it. She isn't thinking about herself. She transcends herself. She is not afraid of poverty, death. She doesn't even think about immortality. That's on one day. On the next day, she says, is this good enough? Is this worthy of Karen Armstrong? I'm glad there's both kinds of experience in your life. Oh, certainly there is. I, I, you know, I'm no Buddha, un unfortunately. I, um, I, have, I have much roiling of the ego and, and all that, still, still somehow to, to, to contend with. Uh, but, I, but, f but you're right. I think, for me, my work is a means of ecstasy because you ca it, f I couldn't pray ever. I was always hopeless at praying. Um, in the meditation I could not do in the convent but with my, with my work I can completely lose myself and get great joy out of therefore and, uh, but other people will get that out, joy out of uh, bringing up their family for example I think marriage, I've never been married I've never even lived with anybody but I, I should imagine that every day you have to forgive something um, or every <laughs> day you have to sort of uh, make accommodations for somebody else's uh, selfishness and, um, and, 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 and I th so all these are tremendous ways I think or, or of um, um, just rubbing the uh, knocking the corners of one's ego I, I think you've, you've done a oh. wonderful job of showing us how to live in the world and transcend our limitations of self. Is it possible that this actually works against the traditional idea of immortality so that if you think that there will be an afterlife in which you'll have some existence, you might be inclined to put off some of this to the, yeah. to the afterlife so that in fact you're better off, you have a richer life if you feel that there is no afterlife. I think, well, I think there's, there's, there's something to be said for that. You see, if you're just doing all these good things so that you can get to heaven, um, as I said, I, I think this just does seem selfish. And, of course, there, are, there have been tendencies, uh, you know, uh, it's been pointed out, where, where poor people or impoverished people or uh, persecuted people have been told to just wait until the next world when, you know, their persecutors will be punished and they will be uh, exalted, as it were. That's not good enough. Um, and um, that, we, that what we have is now. And... Uh, in, in some, you see, in, in some of the Indian traditions, if you're just thinking about getting into heaven, you're not put your, you know, your, your foot on the first ladder. So you have to come back uh, from the world. Even if you get to the world of the gods, you might have to come back to the world of pain and suffering because you're still in your ego. But if you manage to put your ego to one side, then you'll go to Brahman 
then you will merge like those rivers into the sea uh, with great joy. Uh, so um, I think uh, thinking of an eternal sort of permanent ego uh, survival is probably unskillful if that is the sole aim of your religious life. Yes. Would you comment on grace and sacrament and their relationship to immortality? Well, um, I sort of don't see, think much about either of those anymore. Um, I, um, I used to think uh, grace is, has always been a bit of an opaque thing for me. Uh, largely, but I think, and I think this is probably because of uh, my particular religious uh, history, which I think has a larger ramification too. Grace implies something coming to you from outside. I've never experienced the divine in that way. Uh, for me, the divine is something, or the sacred is something, that I find when I'm at my desk, what, from what I'm doing, and it's engendered from within me. And I think that the human race is pretty evenly divided between those who experience the divine as an encounter with outside and grace coming to you from without, things coming from, to you from outside with comfort and joy. And those who sort of, like the Buddha, say, I can generate this but from myself. And, and I'm sure there are probably people living in the Buddhist world who are longing for a revelation, an encounter with a God outside themselves or for grace. And people like me, born in the monotheisms, who always felt a complete flop and a failure because nothing ever did seem to me to be coming from the outside uh, as grace. So, um, uh, I, uh, sacrament, uh, I think, is, is an important concept uh, because it's uh, a way that the divine becomes accessible in our world, imminent to us, and that, we, and that makes the divine active in the world. Uh, it's a, it's a, way of concentrate, a, way, a way of concentrating uh, our attention into, into focusing the, the, the fact that the sacred is here in, 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 this, in this ceremony, for example, and uh, making us live a, a little more aware than, than we usually are, and, with, and, and that we too must then take that grace out to others, always out to others. Let's have someone from over here, yes, uh, with, with the scarf. How do you reconcile the belief in reincarnation with uh, this notion that you can uh, you know, reach this nirvana on earth? Isn't uh, reincarnation sort of implying that there's something better out there or down in my next life? Well, the, 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 uh, mostly the, when uh, the sages thought about karma and reincarnation, as we call it, or um, then they, they were really thinking of not of being born again so much as dying again. Um, and the, the point was to get off this cycle. Uh, they ho it seemed to many people, uh, like the, such as the Buddha, it was bad enough, before his enlightenment, it was bad enough to have to go through old age and a humiliating, ghastly, painful death once, but then to have to go through it again and again and again seemed utterly intolerable. So the point was to get out of this. And you, could, and you could do this perhaps incrementally, perhaps in your next life you could uh, be a monk or something, and have, then you'd have a shot at doing full-time yoga, and, um, and, and you might sort of lose your ego this time, uh, and then it, was be a, it, would be, it, was a, it would be a long process, but the idea was not to be born again, uh, that, that was the goal, was to stop it, to, to get out of that cycle of birth and, and, and re-death. Re, re, re Yes, okay, you, you have the mic. Having studied so many of the different religions and their various routes to, um, to finding the way and um, practicing compassion, do you draw on them all eclectically or do you, do you find that there's one or two that help the best in inculcating compassion? Um, well, I... I, I, I um, have recovered a sense of uh, r appreciation for religion by the study of other traditions. And that gave me a greater insight into what my own Catholic tradition had been trying to do at its best. Um, and I find the, the, 
I, see, I cannot see any one of them as superior to any of the others. I think each has its particular genius um, and special insights. They're not, they're not all the same, uh, because each one has its own genius and, it, and each its own particular flaws and failings and its interesting, arresting differences. Uh, but I, 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 I'm inspired by them all as I, as I study them. They've all got their bad points too, and we mustn't forget all of them without exception. Um, but um, in, in the Chinese have been a real discovery for me uh, on this, a new discovery for me on this, this, in this last book as, as well as the Indian tradition. So I can't even really say I'm a monotheist anymore. Um, you know, um, I, I, I would see myself really as convalescent probably, um, uh, as uh, sort of in recovery. It, um, yes, sir. The, the, it seems to me that what you're describing is the inner structure of generating what John Rawls has described as an outer structure, as the, the thought experiment of making a world in which each of us would be willing to take any of the places. And you're describing uh, the path on the, for internally to, 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 to achieve some of that vision of a society in which we wouldn't, any of us wouldn't mind living. And I, I'm so grateful to you and your work and your willingness to leave your study and come here tonight. So thank you. Well, it's, it's, as, I, as Diana says, it's very nice for me to come here because, uh, and have people to talk to about these things <laughs> uh, because um, I, there's not much uh, uh, that is the, in, uh, interest in my, in my own country. Could we have... I have just heard and been very impressed by an article of our colleague here, Sarah Coakley, on desire. And I sat and thought about that and just spoke, but because the emphasis was so heavy on, uh, on the minus. And uh, she speaks about something which has been lost in modern times which is that desire is a good thing and the desire for God and that leads very often to the analogy of love and, uh, and I wanted you to say a little because I am, if I have had any experiences uh, at some deep level it is that when something absorbs me I don't think about me losing myself. I'm just absorbed. Mm. Uh, no. Yes. Yeah. I'm just absorbed. Yes. And uh, that kind of comes out of uh, desire. Yeah, I, I, abs I absolutely agree. Um, and I think the kind of desires that I am thinking of, of as being negative are those ones that simply say, I want, I want, and, uh, and grabbing and, and getting. But desire is what impels us on the path, of course. Um, and, um, and you're right, when you disappear, I see, I still think of it in those terms, into your studies, you've gone, as it were, you, 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 you have gone. Um, and there's a, I didn't quite get round to reading it. There's a, 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 a one of Zhuang Zi's friends uh, was a contemplative who was found in, in a trance one day, and he looked an entirely different person. Uh, they said, "What happened?" His friend said, "You know, you never looked like that before." And he said, "Don't you understand these things? Just now, I, I, I went, I, I'd gone, and it's a freedom. I think uh, it's that." Freedom that when you are, as you say, absorbed, you're not thinking, I am absorbed. Um, because otherwise, you're still, you're still there, you're not absorbed. Um, you, uh, and so it, these are impossible things to talk about because, as I say, they are, they are beyond words. And, um, and, and love, um, I, yes. I, I suppose that for me, I've not been very successful in love. Um, and so, f for me, love is not really a very, it's just personal to me, uh, not, uh, not been a very uh, helpful thing in my discovery of the spiritual. Uh, but 
so I like the compassion more. Uh, the, 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 something that's generated from me that I can learn to feel with the other. Uh, but by all means, I think we, we, we take everything that is noble in our lives. I think Paul says that in Philippians. Take everything that is noble and good and use it. Um, that's why some of these asceticisms, I, I, you know, I really do want to emphasize that I'm not encouraging a sort of total negativity uh, of the sort that I experienced as a young girl. Uh, which, where that everything in the outside world is bad and, you, and, and, uh, and, and desire is bad. Desire, desire is what uh, makes us go on the spiritual quest in the first place or the, you know, our yearning to, my yearning every morning to get to my desk, for example. Um, or others would experience it as the yearning for the other. Again, you're, you're going, uh, abandoning a position of total self-regard and regarding the other um, and seeing uh, the other as, as godlike uh, and as inspiring and as a grace probably uh, but I suppose it's, it's, it's simply the terms of my own personal journey which has been coming from a, a position of damage and isolation uh, and joining the world again by sort of engineering it from myself. I, I, I'd probably take that, that other line. Yes, sir. Uh. I appreciate your comments about um, the giving or gifting of immortality to other people uh, through selfless living. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, based upon the gentleman's first question about the idea of creating in somebody a true self in order for that true self to be given away, mm. how the gifting of uh, immortality, um, how that can be done in, in to those people that are oppressed or persecuted, that we give, uh, that in giving them themselves and building them up, we're actually giving immortality, which is yes. contrary to what we've been talking about, but in the end ends up being the same thing. Yeah, look, here's a lovely thing that I didn't, just didn't have time to get into my talk. Um, China, ancient China, uh, the rituals performed, you know, you know the Chinese had a very elaborate code of rituals. The eldest son, for example, had to serve his father, uh, you know, had to you know, serve his meals, uh, wash his clothes uh, all day long. Was, uh, and, and, then some, and then the younger brother looked after him and there was a, a reciprocal uh, ritual. Everybody in the family had a, rich, a place whereby they ritually um, served each other. Uh, it was a pretty full-time ceremonial business. Now, th this was slightly magical in the you know, pre-Confucian, it was a magical idea that this, this ritual, they said, uh, enabled the, say, the father to become an ancestor, to achieve immortality. Um, it was a magical idea. It was a sort of, you know, uh, at first. But Confucius saw the great potential of this because if you treat people with absolute respect, they become holy. They become holier. Uh, they learn to re reverence themselves. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, the, the, you know, the, the, the great rit rituals, uh, he said, was uh, uh, confer, you weren't doing these rituals to get immortality for yourself. You were, confer you were serving your father in this ritual way to make him immortal, to bring out his immortal shen to make him godlike and numinous so that and after his death he went on performing these rituals for him so that his spirit could grow and develop into a powerful ancestor doing it for others and i think but i think it went, when you give that an ethical connotation and when uh, and i think to the golden rule today has to be applied to uh, globally too so that we treat other nations and see that they are as important as ourselves. Uh, because in the Axial Age period, uh, this was the beginning of individualism. Uh, indiv you know, it, people were, tr were moving from a tribal, communal identity, and in the towns where you were beginning to get the uh, idea of me, and me and myself as a unique and special individual, the desire to find your own immortal 
in unique self is part of that celebration, as it were, of individualism. And the, uh, way, the, the, the business about compassion was to help uh, to mitigate the clash of warring individuals or clash of warring egos in the town. Now, the cha that was the challenge in the, at that time, was how do we deal with these rampant individuals? Now, the challenge is, we, in our global world, how do we live together? How do we live as one? Love your neighbor as yourself. All, everyone is our neighbor. Uh, we live in one world now, so that what happens in one part of the world will have immediate repercussions uh, to, to, elsewhere. What happens in Iraq today will have repercussions in London um, or Jordan even tomorrow. So... Um, so that, that we are, whether we like it, one, one, of, the, one of the sages, uh, Chinese sages, uh, said we should ha cultivate Jan Ai, concern for everyone. And that means everyone, not just our nearest and dearest. And treat other nations as though they were as important as ourselves. If we, did not, if we don't like something being done to our country, we don't do it to others. And to, uh, that is the challenge, I think, for us now to make our uh, religion speak to this condition of our torn world and, as you say, confer that holiness of individuality on people who are <coughs> deprived. Just as the Chinese, Chinese lavish attention but absolute heartfelt respect, not in any kind of patronizing way of doling out aid and in, in return for... Uh, benefits and, and obedience and ally alliances, but with absolute respect and, and learn to know each other. I'd like to thank our speaker once again for a stimulating uh, session, and I would invite everyone uh, to join her and all of us uh, in the brown room, directly this direction, as far as you can go, uh, for a reception uh, just, just now. So uh, please, you're all invited. Thank you. <laughs>